Welcome! In this series of short videos, we will look at topics common to both the PowerBasic console and Windows compilers. Today, we will look at error trapping. There are two main types of errors you can have in PowerBasic. There are compile time errors and there are run time errors. Compile time errors are where you have made some syntactical error in typing in your code and when you attempt to compile it, the compiler identifies the error and displays it on the screen for you. Those errors are fairly easy to find as each time you try to compile, the compiler will check your code for these types of syntactical errors. However, if you successfully compile your code, there may still be errors that occur at runtime, and those are the errors we're going to look at today. The first type of these is a runtime error where you're attempting to read beyond an array bounding. Say, for example, you dimension an array of 100 elements and you try and read element 101. On this occasion, you may risk having a general protection fault because you're reading beyond the area of memory you've actually assigned for the data. One way of avoiding these is to use the debug error on statement at the beginning of your program. While this does add slightly to the size of your application, it does allow you to actually cope with these attempts to read beyond the array bounding without crashing your application completely. So certainly in development time, I would suggest leaving the debug error on command at the beginning of your code. The second type of error is where something unexpected happens. Usually where you've attempted to access some object that does not exist, uh, you've attempted to access something in a DLL which doesn't exist, or more likely you've attempted to read something from a file or read a file which doesn't exist. Those are the kind of errors we're going to handle today. Errors with reading files. So in our code, we're going to dimension a local variable to handle our file name. So we've dimensioned a local variable called strfile. strfile has been populated with the xe.path, which is the path to where your program currently sits, and we've added onto that the name of the file we want to access, myfile.txt. Now, at the moment, that particular file does not exist in this directory. So if we attempt to do anything with this file, for example, to open it or read any data from it, an error will be generated. So we're going to create a small function to read this file. Our fun read file function will take a single parameter, which is the name of the file it's going to read, the name and the path. So we've created a small stub of a function to read our file. Now we're going to create a couple of local variables, one for the file handle and one for the data we wish to read out of the file. Now when you're opening files, you can quite happily just use numerical file handles. However, to save having to reuse them all the time, the free file statement is very useful. This will populate a long file with the next available file handle. And if we attempt to open the file without any error checking at all, this is where our error is going to occur. We're going to attempt to open the file, we're going to attempt to read information from it, and then we're going to close the file handle down again. And at the very end, we'll just put a message out to the log to show how far we got. Now, since we know this particular file does not exist, we know an error is going to be generated. And we can use the error dollar to tell us what that error actually was. So if we try running that program now, we'll see we got the we got here bad file name or number. So what that's telling us is the code has got into our read file. It's attempted to open it. This is the line that's errored. It can't read from the file 
the file handle is closed and we send our message to a log and this is where the error is actually printed out. Now our program hasn't crashed but our program has obviously expected to actually see a file there. So if your program was expecting to see a file and no file existed you really need to error trap this and handle it. Now some of your programs will be user facing where a user is actually using an application and obviously if you're trying to read a file you would need to tell the user the file can't be found. So how are we going to handle when we have such an error? Well we will clone this little function and we will put some error trapping in. So we'll call it read file 2 and we'll change your program to call that. Now one thing you can do is there's a nice structured error trapping process called try catch. You put a try statement at the beginning and it then gives you a block which you can then trap any errors that occur. So anything that happens when the open statement is used or the line input will be trapped in a catch statement. And you have an optional finally statement at the end and then the end of the end try. So these are the lines of code it's going to attempt to execute. Should any error occur, it will drop into the code that's going to appear in the catch statement. And regardless whether it works or whether it doesn't work, it will drop into the finally statement to close off the file handle. At this point, we can actually trap the error. So we can print out a log that we've had an error, and we can use error dollar to tell us what that error actually was. And then having got that out, when we get to the end of the try catch statement, this line will actually execute. So if we try running that now, you'll find that the we've had an error and it tells us the file's not found, which is quite reasonable since the file does not exist. And we get at the end of the function and it prints out no error. Now it's printing out no error because you've picked up the most recent error here and that clears it out for you. You've then closed down the file and when we get down to here there's no outstanding error at this point because you've already handled it. Now that's fine as far as it goes but we don't know at the moment whether the problem was with the open statement or the line input statement. You can however handle it within error dollar. You could put a select statement here to handle each of those different types of errors quite separately. Alternatively, if we clone this function again, we'll do a third function. And this third function is going to use a nested try. We'll change our original program to call number three. Within the try catch, we're going to nest another try catch statement. So if the first line errors it will go to this line of code. If we wrap the line input also in a try, in this case I don't need to use finally, we'll just use catch and we'll put a suitable line of code in here. So we're trapping both of these lines, the first line for when the file is attempted to be opened and the second try catch is handling data being read from the file. Now we know at the moment since the file doesn't exist that this is the one it's going to fail on. So if we run it again we'll see that the logic hasn't changed we're still getting that. However if we actually create the file in the folder we know that the program is now going to find this file. However there's nothing in the file, therefore any attempt to read from the file is going to fail. So if we run it now, we should get the unable to read data. Which we do. And it's giving the error to say the input is past the end of the file. Which it is indeed. So this allows us to handle the opening of the file, the existence of the file, and data within the file. Another useful statement you can do right at the beginning of your code is to test for the existence of the file. So before we call the fun readme file 3, 
we can actually test to see if str file actually exists. By using the isFile function. If the file actually exists, then isFile will return true. If it does not exist, it will return false. We can test that logic out by simply changing the name of the file we're looking for. So we know there is no myfile2, so this should generate a message to our log to say the file does not exist. Which it does. Another function which is also very useful is the isFolder function. isFolder does exactly the same, only on the folder. So if you are attempting to write to a folder, you can test to see if the folder exists before you attempt to write to it. This is especially useful if you're writing to network folders. If the folder doesn't exist, you can always attempt to create the folder. It's worth having a look in the libraries, because you'll see that in our file handling routines library, there are a number of routines which will read files and write to files. You'll find in each of these we've used the try-catch approach to make sure that no errors will happen at runtime and if the file doesn't exist it will handle it quite happily. In this case if the file doesn't exist it returns an empty lint string. If the file does exist it actually returns the entire content of the file. So this is a short introduction to error trapping on file handling. That's it for today. Thank you for watching.